Father, we stand in your presence by means of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, thankful for such an access into your very presence, thankful for the wonderful realization that you are our loving Heavenly Father, and we're thankful that you have given us the opportunity to study your word through this format. May the Holy Spirit filter out all the foolishness and ignorance, but open our hearts to the wondrous truths of your word. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We've been studying together in the Epistle to the Romans verse by verse, and we don't have much more to go before we finish and move on to Colossians. In our last video, we had reached verse 23, I believe, of chapter 15, Romans 15, verse 23. And we have had a marvelous feast of basic Bible doctrine. We've been presented by the Holy Spirit with the person and the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we have been presented with man's total depravity and his condition separate from Christ. In the last few chapters, we've been looking at our responsibilities as members of the family and the household of God. And now in chapter 15, the Holy Spirit is dealing with a situation of need. The Jews in Jerusalem were in great difficulty, and we'll see that the saints in Macedonia and Achaia made a definite contribution to them through the Apostle Paul. The word certain that Paul uses is a, is a word that declares that it was one ordained by God. It was one that that through His grace they resolved to give to the saints in need in Jerusalem. I believe that we can see in the scriptures that this was a tremendous opportunity to show that there is truth in our relationship with Christ. I think it's important that we, as we go through these texts, folks, to look at, at, at who is being spoken of or who is being spoken about. All of the members, all of the individuals that are mentioned in the text, to try to consider their relationship to one, what their relationship would, would have been toward one another. The Jews in Jerusalem were in tremendous trial, and we'll see that the saints in Macedonia and Achaia made a contribution to these saints. Saints that they had never met. It was one that through God's grace, they came to, they resolved to give to the saints in need in Jerusalem, those whom they had never met. I know that, that may be reading, uh, reading the, in between the, the lines a bit, the white spaces a bit, but I don't think that I'm far off by saying that. It was a tremendous opportunity to show that there was truth in our relationship with Christ. I recently uh, listened to a preacher on the radio when I was driving. He was talking about how you can make a lot of money, you know, if you just sow money for the Lord. And there wasn't one word, not one single word of doctrine, not one word of encouragement. You know, unless encouragement means that if you give a thousand dollars, well, you know, you'll get a hundred times that back. So I guess there's going to be a lot of millionaires pretty soon based on that broadcast. Verse 27, debtors they are, they owe it to them. And I don't think owe there means anything like, well, like owing Verizon for, uh, you know, the lousy service that they provide out here in the country. But owe no one anything except to love one another, for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. We learned that in the 13th chapter. I got a donkey named Jelly Bean, and I don't feed or provide for her needs because of what she gives me or to get something back. I do that because, well, I love her. 
Let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a, cheer, a cheerful giver. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. For if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things, material things. Now, folks, look, I can't deny that both words there in the text, both the words debtor and ought there in the text mean just what they mean. They mean, the word means to owe. But we have to look at this in context as well as taking all of Scripture into account and try to understand what the thought was that the Holy Spirit was trying to convey. We're not under law, and that includes our giving. You know, there are several reasons to give to those in need, and, and I'm not just thinking about money. There's many ways that a person can give. We can give love, support, encouragement, uh, instruction, as, as well as any kind of material need, but there are several reasons to give. One is that you give anticipating a bigger return than what you gave, kind of like an investment. And that is definitely carnal. Another is to give for personal satisfaction, you know, pride. You know, look at what, look at what I gave. You know, I'd like everybody else to know how much I gave, and that's a matter of personal satisfaction or pride. There's another reason to give, and that's because you love the Lord. And, and now we see that the saints in Macedonia and Achaia gave because it pleased them. They made a definite decision to make a certain designated contribution to the saints in Jerusalem. Verse 28, When therefore I have performed this and have sealed to them this fruit. I will come by you into Spain. Other Bible students and, and Bible commentaries have said that, well, the prime reason Paul did this was his pride. I don't believe there's any, any inference in the verse whatsoever that would lead us to believe that Paul was, was determined to make this trip from personal pride. But that's what many have said. When I have sealed to them this fruit there's, a, there's abundant evidence that, that there was hostility between Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. The Jews hated Gentiles. Most Christians understand that. They know that. The Jews hated the Gentile deeply. They exalted themselves in the fact that they were God's people. They were the protectors of His Word, and without a doubt, God used Israel as as a, a guardian of the oracles of God for which we praise Him. And it's out of Israel that our Redeemer came. And I am certain that the Holy Spirit is pointing out here the great concern that God has, that He has, for love of the brethren, folks. That's what I'm seeing in the text. The fact that we love one another is absolutely unique to Christianity. You know, I hate to call it a religion, but it is absolutely unique among the religions of the world. The rest are all based on upon what man can do to please God. And because of that tremendous emphasis, there are too many Christians that think that's what Christianity is. You know, what we have to do is, you know, to please God. This book, folks, is not a testimony of what you do to please God. You search the Scriptures because you think that in them that you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me, John 5, 39. The uniqueness of Christianity is that it is a revelation of what God has done for us, not what we do for God. It's been some time back, but I received an email from... Uh, I shouldn't, I don't want to mention names. I received an email from another ministry. Apparently, Mr. Sewell, you don't believe that we were ever lost. And, you know, and I had to write back, well, apparently you believe somebody can lose something that isn't theirs. 
you know, how can I say that I lost something unless I first owned it? The scriptures are clear that the shepherd found the lost sheep, and when he came back, he had a complete fold. There, there's abundant evidence in the scriptures that God has dealt with the lost, and the very fact that he uses the word lost is tantamount to saying that, that they were his. They weren't his, he couldn't have lost them. All the Father has given me, I shall lose none. I don't know what you know that ministry was teaching, but I don't believe God's a liar. Other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring. And then we have the Lord pouring out his heart in the 17th chapter of John that we love one another. And if you were to be honest with yourself, you'd have to say that sometimes that's hard to do. You know, it's a whale of a lot easier to, I think, you know, to love some terrible sinner and work around to get him to make a, a profession of faith than it is to love other Christians, you know, because they don't have the same conclusion about verses of Scripture that you have. You know, they don't have the same understanding of doctrine. Uh, you know, it's even worse than that. They don't keep house like you do. It's hard to love apart from doctrine. We love God and we love one another because He loves us. We don't have to spend any time beating ourselves trying to please God so that He'll love us. He loves us with an everlasting love. He loved us when we were hostile to Him. He loved us when we were His enemies. He loved us when we were not seeking Him. He loved us when we were not working for Him. He loved us so much He died in our place, and yet we don't see all that much love between Christians today. Now, folks, if God so loved that person that you think is terrible, how should we love them? And, and I am certain that the Holy Spirit is pointing out here that Paul knew that he was heading into great danger. Paul knew that. And yet here was an opportunity to seal to them this fruit. Fruit is the word there. To those of his own nation. The fact that there is love of the brethren. These people in Macedonia and Achaia, they don't even know you. And they've made a tremendous contribution to help you out in this hour of need. And they only did that because of a love that is absolutely unique to the person and the work of Jesus Christ. When I have sealed to them this fruit. I believe the Holy Spirit is saying, here is, here is the Holy Spirit sealing the fact that Christians love one another. You know, we can find ancient writings in Rome in the, in the first and second centuries where people were amazed at how much Christians loved one another. You know, yet I'm not sure we'd find much writing like that today. In the first and second centuries, Christians loved one another so much that they disregarded their own wants, their own needs, their own security to minister to one another in Christ, who had never even met one another. And I believe God wants to see if we love somebody who's doctrinally stupid, you know, and, and that can be hard to do. You know, I, I know of a city here in Oklahoma, you know, that has 78 churches, you know, where just about all of them get together and they have a revival meeting, you know, where that there's not much doctrinal purity, you know, there really isn't, you know, but they're probably wonderful people, you know, several of which I've, I've worked with closely. Folks that you just couldn't help but love. They were just nice, sweet, stupid Christians. Now that's my opinion. But they're God's children. If we were to rate the dumbest Christian to the smartest, and I, I don't know, you know who that is, it would be, the greatest Bible teacher that ever lived, the one that, that had the most sincere grasp of all deep theological understanding, and we considered the great gulf that existed between him and this stupid guy, 
and then compared that to God, well, it'd be the same. You know, kind of like if you took off in a rocket, you know, to, you know, if you thought that you was going to get to the moon, it'd take a, a whole lot less time to get to the moon to take off in a rocket to get and get, and get to the moon if you blasted off from the top of Mount Everest than you did Death Valley. Folks, it don't make any difference. There's no difference between the most brilliant Christian that you ever met and the most stupid Christian you ever met compared to God. And we don't hate an infant because he can't because he can't integrate a differential equation. You know, he may someday if if he ever you know gets through school, but when he's only two or three years old, we don't hate him because he hasn't grown up yet to understand calculus. And yet we seem to do that in Christianity. And I believe that the Holy Spirit is pointing out that these Jews who knew the, the first five books of the Scriptures by heart, who understood the nuances of the words and, and have seen the marvelous revelation of Him whose visage was so marred more than any man, You know, God has, had laid on him the iniquity of us all. How that must have struck the heart of a Jew. But these Gentiles in Macedonia, probably un until very recently, had never read any chapters in the book of Isaiah. Many of them probably, probably I doubt they even knew that the book of Isaiah existed, many of them. And all of a sudden, they're giving to the necessity of these saints. And I believe the Holy Spirit is pointing out that they had a responsibility to do exactly what they did. And I'm going to certify this gift to point out carefully that these believers in Macedonia and Achaia are not doing this for any return, but out of love. That's, that's what I'm seeing in this passage. They're not expecting to get back a hundredfold. They did this because they love you and recognize the need, and that has to be based on Christ. The white spaces, folks, to me, say to me that the Holy Spirit is sending Paul to Jerusalem to show them the doctrinal purity of this act of faith. That's what the word seal means. This fruit, it's, it's called fruit. You know, in modern Christianity, fruit is, you know, money and fruit is winning souls and, uh, you know, but the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, peace, joy, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, forbearance, uh, or temperance. Against such, there is no law. So the word fruit here, I believe, has to be one of those, and I believe it's the word love. That's not going to be apparent to the Jews in Jerusalem unless somebody is there with a doctrinal comprehension to explain to them what's going on. And when he says, seal this fruit, you know, to me, Paul is going to point out the doctrinal purity of this exercise of faith. Then I will come by you into Spain. I don't believe Paul is selfishly, uh, jealously, proudly deciding, I'm going to go back and I'm going to show you know, all the things that I've wrought among the Gentiles. Look, you know, look what I can bring back to these Jews. I think the Holy Spirit is sending Paul back to preach the doctrine of the person and the work of Jesus Christ that resulted in this gift of love, and it's called fruit. And I believe it's a fruit of the Spirit, and Paul wants to make sure that they know that. And I believe the Holy Spirit is telling us that that was more important. The spiritual, biblical truths of this gift is more important in Paul's life, in fact. And then he says, I will come by you into Spain. And... Uh, yeah, you know, there's some some that say that he didn't, and some that say that he did. I personally believe that he did. I know 
in the word zoida. It's a, an, an emphatic indicative. I know that when I come unto you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. I'm absolutely convinced that he came in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. There, there are commentaries that you'll read commentaries that say that he really didn't. That was just his desire. I believe that he did. I also believe that at this moment, you are in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. You know, it seems to be in the, in the Christian community the result of some good thing that you did. The reason, folks, God blesses you is because He loves you in the most difficult situation that you could possibly be in is a blessing from God. Verse 29, I'm sure that when I do come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ's gospel. And my question would be, how could it be otherwise? Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He was buried. He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. No matter what physical difficulties meet you in your walk, you are in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. I know that. And so I can't rob that verse of all of its power, all of its wonder and grace by suggesting that Paul's making a foolish, well, he's making a foolish statement that never really came to pass. I read that last night in some commentaries. Most of modern Christianity, uh, you know, the what I refer to as the world, the world religious system based on human merit you know they say that, that well good things come from God and all of the difficulties in your life they come from your stupidity and your ignorance and, and Satan the devil either what we read is true or it isn't and if you don't think it's true I don't know really why you'd study the scriptures or why you'd go to church or why you'd pray or witness or do anything else God says, I love you with an everlasting love. I'll never cease to sustain and uphold you. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I hold you in the hollow of my hand. More than that, I branded your name on the palms of my hand. I've lit your candle. I bottle your tears. I know the way that you take, and when I've tested you, you will come forth as gold. There's no doubt about that. He's my Lord and He's my Redeemer. To even suggest that some petty fleshly thing can rob me of that blessing of God disturbs me. What kind of a, of a heavenly Father do we have? Is, is He a Father so slack, so unable, so unloving, to allow you to stumble on your own way and eventually drop you into hell or destroy your life. I don't know how many Christians have told me over the years, you know, I don't know, Steve, you don't know what I've done. You know, when they were young, that they did this, that, or the other thing, and it destroyed their life. You know, they wanted to serve the Lord, but because of this or that sin, they quit reading the Bible, they quit praying, they quit going to church, they just quit the whole thing. You know, their life is wasted, ruined, shot, done. You know, what kind of a God do you have? If God isn't working in you to will and to do of His good pleasure, then He's a liar, and I resign from this ministry. I'm just wasting my time. You know, I, I don't have any desire to study or to, to teach or, or anything else. But God is not a liar. This is what He has said is true about you and me. My God is God. I know that when I come, however it is, I'll be in the fullness of the blessings of Christ's gospel. And again, it's simple genitive. The gospel of Christ, once again, it's Christ's gospel, not mine, not my good news, says Paul, but His. 
It's the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Not anything Paul does. Christ's gospel. Now verse 30. Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit that you strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. And the word strive there in the original text is agonizomai. That's agonize. Properly, it means, you know, fight together, agonize together, strive together with, strive with ag agony with me in prayer. Why? Why? Well, it's not going to set well with many of you. But the ultimate conclusion of any study on prayer is that prayer is asking God to do what you know God's going to do. And everybody says, yeah, that's stupid. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Well, you think God wants his name hallowed. Thy kingdom come. Well, you think it will? Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You think it will? Well, that's for another video. I don't think that, folks, that you have a greater privilege than the privilege of communing with God in that regard. This agonizing seems to suggest to me that they're praying, they're agonizing to try to get God to do something that they're not sure that he wants to do. You know, on the surface, you know, you, that's, that's, you know, I want you to agonize together with me in prayer that we get a giant boost in subscribers. You know, or that I get a four-wheel drive vehicle because the back roads here in Oklahoma are so bad. Verse 31, that I may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea. These verses are all interconnected, folks. And that my service which I have for Jerusalem may be accepted of the saints. The words do not believe there in the in the tick in the King James the authorized version those words it's not pistuo it's not faith it's one word apatheo literally refuse to be persuaded by the lord it's our word for persuade Refuse to be persuaded by the Lord. This is our Greek word for persuade. Be persuaded by them that have the rule over you, for they watch over your soul. Same word. And here, it is that I may be delivered from them who are not persuaded by the Lord in Judea. And again, I ask, well, was he? I'm going to say absolutely. Now, you can look at that in different ways. I mean, you know, it's true that the Romans delivered him. They kept him absolutely safe. They found out that he was a Rome, Roman uh, citizen. He had privileges, even though he was bound. Privileges, you know, no other prisoner had. But was he delivered from those who refused to be persuaded by the Lord? Absolutely. So that was answered. And that my service, which I have for Jerusalem, may become accepted of the saints. And I believe it clearly was. Dearly beloved, is there anything in that prayer that you would think that God wouldn't want? Verse 32 there are people who believe that verse 32 is a new thought and then there, you know, there's those who believe it's still part of the prayer and that's me. I think we're still in the prayer that I may come unto you with joy by the will of God and may with you be refreshed. Well, now we know that didn't happen, right? I mean, he, he didn't come unto them uh, in joy or did he? 
I mean, look, let's see. He went through, th you know, three trials at least. He was bound, shipwrecked, and uh, persecuted. I say he came with them, to them with joy. I mean, what is joy? I mean, is joy having everything your own way? No difficulties, no trials. No. I believe absolutely that Paul rejoiced. I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I absolutely believe that that was an answered prayer. He came to them with joy and it was by means of God's will. It wasn't maybe the way he planned it. And, and surely there are many things in your life that may not be the way that you plan them. But there's joy if we know that it's God's will. The only way that you can give thanks for all things is to believe that our sovereign God ordained it. It's for your good and by His will. Now, if that isn't joy, I don't know what joy is. If you can't give thanks for it, then you don't have that conviction. Folks, I think that you give thanks. I think we give thanks for, for making $2 million on a real estate deal. And I think that we give thanks for, you know, almost getting our head knocked off by a tree limb, a tree branch, because we didn't duck low enough when our horse ran under it. I think that you give thanks for a broken wrist when your horse fell on top of you. And I think you give thanks for a wonderful vacation, you know, or a beautiful wife. I think you give thanks for an ugly wife. If you don't give thanks, then, then what you're saying is you don't believe God was in it. That He didn't have any part, any, He didn't have anything to do with this. And, I, you know, I hear that from Christians every day. Well, I, I don't blame God, Steve. You know, it was my stupidity. You know, I'd never blame God. I just got out of His will and I went my own way. Was, folks, was Samson out of the will of the Lord when he went down to get a Philistine wife? Samson's parents did, didn't know that it was of the Lord. You know, once you know that, there's the joy and, and thanksgiving that governs your life, your walk, your behavior, your conduct. I believe that he came with joy by means of God's will, not by means of his will. Last verse, 31. Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. And we know that there is a peace that comes and goes, and then there's a peace that doesn't come and go. The peace that comes and goes is because we believe it to be dependent upon our performance on something that we must do. The peace that our Lord gives is based on the work that He did on our behalf. That's why it doesn't come and go. That's why it's the peace that passes all understanding. And I, Amen means let it be so. I want to take a moment to thank you all tremendously. Thank you all for hanging with this series of studies through the Epistle to the Romans. Uh, been a lot of videos. Uh, I hope you enjoyed our little rapture uh, movie, Bright Twilight. I want to thank you for all of your prayers all of your support. Those of you have, who have continued to support this ministry, Sue and I thank you from the bottom of our heart. You know who you are. Until next time, I love you all. I truly do. Thanks for watching.